All right. So today we're covering managing your weight. We'll go over current events. I want to review the up latest updated <laughs> syllabus with you. Get feedback if find out what you think about it. Review video materials. Then we'll get into the breakout groups. I posted the questions in case anybody wanted to get a head start on looking at the materials. Then we'll come back into the classroom as it were and review to make sure that everybody's on the same page with what's going on and talk about next week. All right. Ah, the resounding yes. Oh, but first, yes, current events. So Joey, what do you have? I think I need sound, yes, okay. All right, so I took a look at an article from healthline.com and I tried to find something that was relevant to the whole situation we have going on. And the article was about if taking vitamin C can like have an impact on the coronavirus and whatnot. Uh huh. And well, the article starts off and says like, no supplement will cure, prevent disease or prevent disease. So they get that disclaimer out there. Good. They do say that um, they're starting to study if, like, they intravenously, like, yeah. put vitamin C into you, if that can help treat COVID-19. And um, there's some evidence from animal research that um, high dose of vitamin C can reduce, reduce lung inflammation in other uh, respiratory illnesses, like uh, the H1N1 swine flu that we had about a decade ago. Right. or other viruses but in general they need to do a lot more research um and where the research is going on is in china right now and there's a shanghai medical association a report where they did endorse a high dose of vitamin c for treatment for people hospitalized with covid19 yeah but i think as we're seeing like there's a lot of stuff going on in china where we really don't know what's going on and um so there's no, since it's not really a clinical trial, um, there's no like concrete evidence. Yeah. So what I took away from it, it's like, I guess the vitamin C can just kind of help like respiratory illnesses a little, but I don't know if it really help you with this too much. I think your comment that they're, they haven't done any clinical trials, unless you do a double blind placebo control, you don't know, but I think if somebody wanted to take vitamin C thinking that it might help, if it's something, as long as they're not doing it in place of something else, there's yeah. no data to show that it, you know, decreases the severity and duration. I mean, it may help reduce the severity and duration of symptoms, but it hasn't been shown in any large amount to do that. And what I've read in, in combination with the zinc supplements, because some people were also taking zinc, that the combination of vitamin C and zinc makes the zinc less effective. So if it, I'd rather see people drinking lots of that, uh, forgive me, but these are trying times, you know, drinking lots of fluids that have vitamin C in them just to make sure they stay hydrated. Um, but yeah, we're gonna see a lot of stuff coming out with lots of suggestions, lots of snake oil, and it's gonna be tough to separate myth from misinformation, myth from facts. So that's where, like what you were saying, whether or not there were any trials, that was the exact right thing. Okay. Yeah. Kyle, do I have the right Kyle? Where's my, I have two Kyles. Is my other Kyle here? Uh, I'm, I'm here. I believe oh, you. okay. I don't remember checking you in, but I guess I did. Um, so what have you for us? I found, I also kind of wanted to look at something involving the, uh, virus and I uh, so I found an article from the New, the New England Medicine Journal that is essentially stating that uh, low-income children are going to have problems meeting their nutritional needs in the coming months due to a lack of uh, like qualities and like resources basically yeah. um, and that uh, they said that when schools and ch ch child care centers close children are missing out on food services worth at least $30 a week um, and that the USDA is allowing school superintendents and school boards to uh, apply approaches from the USDA summer feeding programs and have been encouraged to ensure that the needs of low-income children are met during extended school dismissals. However, the meals don't follow the same nutritional standards as regular school lunches. Also, they're not sure whether the idea is cost-effective or whether if it, if it will help spreading the virus because there's not really a good way to give the food out. Oh, God. Wow. Um, oh, sorry. Um, no, 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 it's just so sad. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then basically they're just going on saying like the, the short term health effects of missing meals that they're worried that low income kids in like uh, rural areas will, or uh, state like cities and rural areas will uh, face or that they'll include fatigue and reduced immune response, um, which include the risk of contracting uh, communicable diseases and even brief periods of food insecurity can cause long term developmental, psychological, physical and emotional harms. and uh, children from low-income households who are already at a higher risk for poor health and academic performance and children from high-income households may be further disadvantaged by uh, nutrition shortfalls. Um, so basically what I took away from it is that they were basically saying that there hasn't, there aren't good policies in place to get these kids the meals that they need and eat the ones that they are, they're not really getting like the nutritional value that they need out of it. Oh my. So it just seems like we aren't really prepared for what's happening right now on any number of levels yeah david what do you have okay so i have an article i found it about it's called ray's wellness metabolism drops um all right i'm all over that <laughs> you already heard about it no no i'm sorry i can't keep my mouth shut okay <laughs> um yeah so apparently like girls um like before the coronavirus started they started taking like these um like raised wellness metabolism drops to help lose weight. Um, so it has caffeine, raspberry ketones, and taurine. It's like found in, it's an amino acid found in Monster and Red Bull. Um, and apparently it helps lose weight. Um, yeah. uh, like if you, if you combine, combine that with like just straight up like not eating, like some of these people were just eating like, they had like, like a cinnamon, like drink for breakfast yeah. and before they went to bed yeah. and they combined it with the drops and they would eat like celery. Uh -huh. So I mean like, that's just not healthy at all. Yeah. But, right. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that's what I found. So when you say combine it with not eating, I think how about if you just are not eating to show that. Yeah. That's really just happen. not healthy. <laughs> right. Right. There's nothing. They, they like, yeah, they like stopped selling them too because people were like kidding? misusing them. No kidding. Yeah. How would somebody possibly be using it correctly? I, that's the point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And that is current. And yes, there's no pills, combination of pills, whatever else I said in that video, there's no magic way. It takes time, decreasing intake and increasing expenditure. Oh, wait, no, that's today. <gasps> I don't want to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. So what I wanted to do was ask you what you thought about the changes that I posted, sent out in the syllabus that I wanted to make. That the, so the diet projects are still due, no. See, this was wrong, oops, God, I'm working well. So the diet projects are not due on the 31st, they're due on the 7th, but what I did was I have the exam April, I'm gonna post the questions on like the 13th, and there will be some kind of pick five out of seven or five out of 10 or whatever, um, and that you'll write the answers and submit them and I trust you. But then the 14th, instead of the exam being on the 14th, the 14th will still be a class day in that you're still responsible for the videos by the 16th. Does anybody have a problem with that? I can't see you all than the way I have my screen set up, so you have to tell me if there's a concern. But we, what we don't really have in classroom classes on Tuesdays, on this particular Tuesday, so I thought you'd have the time for the exam and then you're just responsible so that when we get together on Thursday, you will be endowed with all kinds of new knowledge just to keep talking about nutrition. So if anybody has concerns about that and you aren't speaking up because I can't see you or your sound isn't working, let me know. Otherwise, I'm just gonna take this as a, that looks great, thanks. One of the things before we get into the material uh, that I did not put on the slides, because we're talking about weight control. And one of the things that I learned from the study that Dr. Hall did was that a pound of fat is 3,500 calories. And that when you're in negative energy balance to the tune of minus 500 calories a day, that should be 3,500 calories over a week with the loss of a pound of fat. And according to that 
hypothesis, if you will, it looks like fat should just kind of, you know, if you're a negative energy balance, you should just lose weight like this. Unfor and unfortunately, it's more like this. To me, has, did I, has anybody watched The Good Place? I can't see everybody. So what does this remind you? Does this remind you anything in The Good Place, Kyle? Do you remember Jeremy Baramy? Uh, huh. It's been a while since I've seen it, and I don't think I've seen the most recent season. Well, so this is how time works. This is not ringing a bell. Okay, it doesn't work this way. That you may be a negative energy balance, but sometimes you're gaining weight, sometimes you're losing weight because there are metabolic shifts that go on in the body that affect weight loss. When you're breaking down fat, it breaks down into CO2 and water while it releases ATP for energy. And sometimes that takes a while for the body to excrete or to get rid of that water. So there's no magic formula. It's just perseverance. So that's what my, that's what, that's my current event, Jeremy Barry. All right, let me, whoops, stop sharing. All right, everybody awake? Everybody trying to be awake? Okay, what I want to do now is put you into groups. Does anybody have any questions in the material that we went over before you get into the breakout groups? Okay. Oh, and before I forget, I want to thank those of you that did get in touch to go over your diet projects. Um, that was good. I'm glad you did that. I'm glad that folks were, I was able to help people. So what I'm going to do now is divide you into five groups this time. I s emailed you the questions. They're also on Blackboard under questions. So we'll get into those groups and you'll, you'll have very important discussions and I will come in and help you or talk through them with you. And then we'll get back together and figure out what everybody got from the information. Okay, let's see. Okay, go to your rooms. It's funny to me. That is so cool. Okay. Yeah, we'll flush you out. Yeah. Hi, so group one, you know what question you folks have? Uh, to explain how surface area is involved one. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll give you a couple minutes and we can come back and talk. Hi, so you folks know what knowledge you need to expound on? Question two. Everybody have a copy of it? Yeah. All right. I'll be back. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. How yeah. the fight gets into like folks know what you're supposed to do. So I'll be back in a while. So you have question number three, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you folks are sharing your knowledge on question number four? That's a good one. I can't wait to hear what, what you come up with, what you understand. All right, I'll see you in a bit. And you folks are gonna talk about apples and pears? Okay, I'll be back in a bit. If you have any questions for me, we can talk about it then. In the meantime, I'll pause this. Right, so what I'd like to, well, first, well, no, let's do this first and then I'll just kind of ask what kind of crazy diets you folks have heard people on. Okay, so folks in group one, explain how surface area is involved in energy expenditure. What say you? Anybody from group one? Okay. 
Hello? Hi. Are you? Oh, Lindsay, I thought you were in group one. <laughs> ah. Um, oh, oh, I actually don't have the word, exact wording of the question. I will help you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, do, do you need it or I could just kind of it. summarize what, what we, t you talked about in the group. Okay. Yeah. Our first question is about, um, surface area. So the way surface area comes to play is that when your body has surface area, uh, you have a higher BMR. That means that automatically happen within your body, you would be burning more calories. So having a larger uh, surface area can mean that you're taller because as shown in the video, there's a little um, visual that if you're taller, even if you're leaner, it takes up more surface area. So then basically the body needs to use more energy to maintain uh, normal body temperature and bodily functions. So an example of a way to kind of think about how that would work is if you're someone who's tall and you're standing outside and it's cold out and you don't have proper jacket on uh you might kind of like scrunch in because you're cold and effectively that decreases your surface area and helps to keep you a bit warmer where then if you stand up very in tall after that you'll probably feel a bit colder again because your body is going to be needing to use more energy to keep you warm and thus that would be burning more calories right and so if you have that greater surface area exposed out in the cold what are you going to do what does your body do to help keep you warm gonna like you're gonna shiver. Yeah. And shivering yeah. increases energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All, right. All right, group two, the difference between leptin and ghrelin and weight regulation, set point theory. Sure. So okay. um, leptin and ghrelin are like the two like energy balance regulators and like the hormones. So leptin is um, the one that suppresses appetite and hunger while ghrelin will be the one that increases hunger. And so in relation to the set point theory, um, it'll kind of revolve around a certain weight and depending on how far off you are from that weight, um, it'll increase or decrease the two hormones. So if you're above weight, for example, um, it would increase leptin production and make you hung uh, less hungry um, and suppress ghrelin. Um, to do the same thing, pretty much. So then we thought of if we're considering a med developing a medication, it would have to um, attack more like receptors and increase intake efficiency because if you aren't developed, um, if if you aren't deficient, then um, it won't react well. So we thought that if we wanted to create a medication that um, was conducive to weight loss, it would increase leptin and uh, le leptin receptor intake and decrease gremlin receptor efficiency. Right. So, yeah, it would make you more sensitive to the leptin that your body is producing and less sensitive to the ghrelin that your body's producing. Right. So, and that the, I think another example that I gave in the video was a thermostat. Think of your set point as a thermostat. It's set at a certain level. And when the temperature goes up, the air conditioning comes on. So when your weight goes up, it's the leptin that would increase to bring the weight back down. When the temperature goes below what that set point is, the heat comes on. And in this case, we're talking about an increase in ghrelin to grow the appetite to make it go back to the set point. So that, that would be what ghrelin and left and have their involvement. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to jump in at any time. Okay, good. Um, group number three, hypertrophic, hypertrophic <laughs> and hyperplastic obesity. What's that about? So um, hypertrophic is an increase in the size of a fat cell, whereas hyperplastic is the increase in a number of fat cells. So um the difference between them is obviously like one increases the size of the cell the other increases the number of cells and the hypothesis is that um when you lose weight you as seen in the animal models when you lose weight the size of the sh cells shrink but you don't actually see a decrease in the number of fat cells and then the theory like hypothesizes that 
This makes it harder to keep weight off if you're not losing the actual fat cells because they're still present. Um, and then they can, they're already there to like grow again if you were to put on more weight. Um, and that like, if you were to lose the actual fat cells, it would be easier to keep weight off. Yeah, that's the, that would be how that would hypothesize, right. And I don't really know, what I was saying was I don't really know how this has been tested in humans because you would basically have to over time somebody is losing weight or losing body fat and you're drawing a chunk of fat cells from them and looking at the difference in cell size or cell number. And I just don't know that that would get past human subjects. I don't doubt that they would have volunteers, but I don't know that that's, that's a study that would be done in, in humans. Liposuction, I guess, is something that reduces body fat, but that doesn't mean that you can't increase fat around where that fat has been removed. If you had liposuction, say, and you had fat tissue removed from your abdomen, but you still, your intake was still greater than your expenditure, then over time you would put on body fat, but it would be around the area where that tissue was removed. And I can only imagine it would look odd. So it's not, I don't, I uh, don't recommend that. Okay, okay. Group four, weight loss and fat loss. Why should you know the difference? Um, we said that for just regular weight loss, it might just be you had like a big meal and like the food, like the actual weight of the food that you ate is the weight that you gained. Yeah, that was but you have to, yeah, but you have to have like an actual, um, increase in calories like over your the 3500 3, calorie per pound um limit to actually gain the fat cells um and we also said that when you're losing weight um mm -hmm. lose your actual fat cells it's like a longer process and you have to be uh, more consistent with the way that you exercise and decrease your calorie intake but just like losing water weight on like those fad diets, you you see the results that are quicker because you're just you, you're losing the water in the cells or like you're not really losing fat. So you have to be careful of like what the difference is. So if you want to maintain fat loss, if you want to lose weight and take it off, the one component that's not intake and expenditure is behavior change. You have to change the behaviors that led you to overeat to begin with. If you're somebody who eats under stress, you go on a fad diet, you lose weight quickly, you go off the diet, but you never learned how to deal with stress, as soon as you're back in a stressful situation, you'll start overeating again. So changing behaviors is the hardest part. Now, I think just to kind of bring back something that we talked about at the beginning of the semester when we talked about um, glycogen, we have a limited capacity to store glycogen. We store it in our muscle and our liver. The thing is we store glycogen with water. And so when you go on a fad diet, when you start losing weight really quickly, then you are breaking down your glycogen stores. And when those glycogen stores are broken down, you're also losing water. So you lose the glycogen, you lose the water. And that's part of the reason why low carb diets have such a quick weight loss at the beginning. But you also, with, if the behaviors are not, the behaviors are not sustainable, but you can you are still losing, you may lose some muscle mass and you may lose some body fat. But the idea is if you want to do it in a healthy manner, you want to change your body composition so that you have a lower percent body fat and you want to have a higher percent muscle mass. And so losing fat takes time. And that's when you are working with a professional or being sensible about it. The example I gave when I went into your group was I work, I've worked with people and I've said, how about three Oreo cookies instead of six? How about a Happy Meal instead of a whatever a huge amount of fast food that you can get? Because you have to, if you're trying to lose weight or if you want to change your body composition over time, you have to make changes that are sustainable. And that's where the behavior component comes in. So small, sustainable changes over time can help draw on those fat stores, on those, you know, those numbers of fat cells, pull the triglyceride out of the fat cell so that it gets broken down for energy, and then increase muscle mass if you're able to continue exercising and change the behaviors. 
that led you to overeat with begin with to begin with and that's how you help to keep that fat loss and to lose it over time and keep it off again it's the jeremy bear me i mean it's all over the place but that's a better formula than following a a fad diet that doesn't have you change behaviors. Any questions about that one? All right, and then apples and pears. All right, so the apple-shaped person um, has more fat in their abdomen, so um, they have more visceral fat um, around their organs, which leads to higher disease risk. And a pear-shaped person has um, more fat around the hips area. Right, um, and they have subcutaneous fat, which um, is the fat that's found like right underneath the skin, right. and it's not as harmful um, for disease risk, like heart disease, diabetes, that type of thing. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be. So the reason why women tend to have pear shape, it appears to have an evolutionary benefit to childbearing, that having weight in your hips and your in, in that part of your body is associated with improved childbirth outcomes. It doesn't mean that there aren't women who have apple shapes. There are, there are lots of women who do. And most women after menopause, when they stop producing estrogen, they start to accumulate fat in their abdominal region. And around that time is when women start to have an increased risk for type two diabetes, for hypertension and for heart disease which are the chronic illnesses that are associated with the pear shape or intra-abdominal or visceral fat. And visceral means, this comes from viscera, meaning organs, right? So any questions about the group questions, the breakout questions? So this week's, so this topic was on weight control. So my question to you folks is, what are some of the diets that you've known people to go on and things that have worked and haven't worked? And I will close my eyes and pick somebody if I have to. <laughs> All right. Libby, have you known anybody who's ever tried to lose weight? This is different than looking at my list and pointing. <laughs> um, so I had a family member who tried the Whole30 diet a couple of times and like it worked for those 30 days and like she noticed changes um, like with her weight and also like in her taste buds. Um, but over time, she kind of went back to eating the same foods that she had eaten before. So like for those like 30 to 45 days, it worked. But then like in the long run, it wasn't super sustainable. It wasn't sustainable. Who else has known folks that have tried to lose weight? Um, so my dad and I went on like a fad diet uh, my senior year called Awaken 180. Um, and that was basically like not pre-made food, but you would eat like five meals in a day. And a lot of it was like they had for you. And then one or two meals you had, like you would make your own protein and vegetables. And it was just, it was mainly focused on like low carbs, high fat. But once like I noticed I got off of it, like it's really, it's an easy way to like stay controlled and lose a ton of weight really quickly. And like, I like lo lost a lot of, that percentage, but not really sustainable because it's a completely day, completely different way of eating in like a regular world. Anybody else know folks who've tried to lose weight? Can I ask something, Professor? Sure. Do you know anything about Garcinia Cambogia? Yeah, Dr. Oz tried to sell it, and I wouldn't do anything that Dr. Oz recommends outside him being a cardiothoracic surgeon. Okay, so that's that's just it's phony. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Have you heard about it? My dad. He, Pardon? I think he, my dad tried it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering. Yeah. I, I may have told you folks that I used to weigh about 20, 25 pounds more than I do now. And it's interesting because at 65, I haven't put it on yet. But in this period of stress, I certainly might. But it wasn't really for me until I stopped following these diets. Now I'm just an N of one, so you must keep that in mind. But I've tried a lot of fad diets. I tried you know, low carb, low fat. I tried fasting. I remember buying the book and sitting under a tree and thinking, I can do this. I can make it till lunch. You know, It just wasn't something that worked for me. And when I was in graduate school, I actually jogged because everybody else jogged. 
Um, but I realized that wasn't the exercise that I like to do. But then I don't know, I don't know what, well, I know what happened. I, I read an interesting book. And again, this is just my anecdote. It was called Fat is a Feminist Issue, which basically said, if you could eat whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, yes, you would put on weight at first. But then over time, if you knew you could have those cookies whenever you wanted to, you wouldn't want them as much. And it's a real scary thing for people to try. But I find that, I don't know. I mean, I correlate that with when I started losing weight. So it's just kind of interesting to me. And just self-disclosure, I had a client once who was very taken with the non-dieting approach to weight control, which is what I'm, or weight loss, which is what I promote as a professional. And I have a very small book called At Peace with Food that I self-published. My father was my biggest client. He bought like 50 books and gave them to all his friends and said, if you like it, keep it. If you don't like it, give me 10 bucks. So of course everybody loved it. Um, every now and then I get an email from Amazon saying $4.44 has been deposited in my PayPal account. And I'm like, I can retire. But it was I, about, the, it's a non-dieting approach to weight loss. And the idea is that it's scary to let yourself eat whatever you want, whenever you want. And it doesn't work for everybody. You have to be comfortable with changes that can happen. But the idea was that you worked on the behaviors and that we learn to trust ourselves. And I think that, and I see this even with you, your demographic, that people don't trust themselves. That's why you have cheat days, isn't it? Because that's when you allow yourselves to eat whatever you want, what, as much as you want, because it's bad and that's your day to be bad. And I, I, that just makes me really sad. So if you ever, or at a loss. I understand it sounds just like me and it's a real quick read. Um, I was going to do a talk on Friday for this group and I bought books, but it was canceled. I don't know why. If anybody wants one, I could send you one. <laughs> but it basically fo you know, focused on the non-dieting approach to weight control and just basically on changing behaviors. It's risky and it won't, doesn't work for everyone, but that's kind of my, my concern when people are trying to lose weight is that they put it on and off and on, off, put weight on, take it off and just learn to not be hungry anymore. They don't know what they're hungry for. Um, so that's my concern. So thank you for listening to my Ted rant. What questions do you have from the information that was in the material? Any questions? Um, I, I do have, have some, yes, please. A question about the diet project. Oh, um, please. How, how do you want us to submit all the different forms? Like, do you just want us to attach them all in an email or should we try and put it all in one document? Or? You can just, yeah, it, I'll get it as a zip file. Like if you just add each form individually, I'll get it as a zip file. If you wrote down your, your you know, the first form where you wrote down what you ate in your exercise, if you take a snapshot of it, you can send that, you know, I'll download it as a zip um, and I'll just look at it through there. Okay. Just a, a heads up, please, no decimal points. Please, no, no decimal, decimal points. points at all. Like, well, I, if you put them in the form five where you're calculating, um, you know, not your final energy expenditure, but along the way, that would be fine. But unfortunately, I've had people careless just with decimal points out to six places, and that's not necessary. So, yeah, okay. just kind of round it. Other questions? Yeah, that's right. Those are due. So yeah, email them. You can email them. If you want to have comments, please, you know, just make a note in your email that you would like me to comment on it. And I'll try to make comments. Um, I'll save it and just write in it. I guess if you send it to me as a Word document, I can, I can do that. Um, I, I don't know how else to, I don't know how to do that with the PDF. But if you don't want comments, don't, you can send a PDF. That's not a problem. How are you doing with your diet projects? I revised the movie thanks to one of your colleagues, the video I mean that I made for with instructions, but please just remember to use the forms that are on Blackboard. Okay, answer the questions that are on Blackboard. Use the, the references that are on Blackboard. All right, so let me once again share my screen with you just to see what's coming up.
So next week, we'll start talking about fitness, nutrition and fitness. And there are a number of videos for you to watch. Um, this one here on respiration. One of the things that, we're, that I'm talking about in the videos is where the energy for aerobic and anaerobic exercise comes from and aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. The video, this particular video will go into cytoplasm, into the mitochondria where the energy comes from. At the end of it, I emphasize what you need to know and why, but it's helpful to look at the whole thing. It's a little more chemistry, but I don't have a blackboard to draw it on. I don't have a whiteboard. And so I put this together for you. If you have any questions before next class, that's fine. I'd be happy to answer them. And one of the things that we'll do besides review the information is what I will do is I will give you in your groups a different type of activity. Let's say it's uh, sprinting across the finish line at the marathon. What is that aerobic or anaerobic activity? What kind of fuel are you using? Why are you using that particular fuel? And spoiler alert, the different fuels are creatine phosphate, lactic acid, glucose, and fatty acids. So those will be the different energy sources, but depending on the intensity and duration of the activity, that will affect which fuel you use and why. And that's what I want you to know, and that's what we'll be talking about. Okay, so that's for next week. And I guess we're done. Um, Kate, could you just stick around for a second? I just have a question to ask you. Yep. All right, and thank you very much. Uh, be well, take care of yourselves, and I'll see ya. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Professor. You too. Thanks, Professor. Thanks, Professor. I will be in my office on Tuesday if anybody wants to stop in and share TV shows, jokes, questions, concerns.